Come on, somebody, make some noise if you're glad to be in church today. Come on. Come on, can we make some noise for Jesus today? Can we make some noise? Well, y'all are looking good. Go ahead and turn to the person you're standing next to. Tell them they're looking good. You're glad to see them. Merry Christmas. If you have not yet listen to the new Christmas album by Rock City Worship, then do it today. Just anywhere you listen to music, you can look up Rock City Worship and you'll, you'll hear that song just as it was uh, performed uh, just now. I want to welcome you wherever you're joining us from today in person at one of our locations, uh, online, if you're watching on television, or if you're joining us from one of the hundreds of prisons all across the nation. Church, can we put our hands together for every man and woman behind bars? tuned in right now, joining us from afar. It is always an honor to uh, bring this experience to those who are unable to be here in person. And so we're glad to, to be joining you today. I, I, I'm really excited because this Thursday night, we kick off our Christmas Eve candlelight service. Anybody ready for the Christmas Eve candlelight service? Starting Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, make sure you, you bring somebody's with you just bring a whole bunch of somebody's with you it's going to be an incredible experience you you may notice uh at our hilliard location uh, and even if you're watching from a distance you you might notice that there's just been some things shifting around we're preparing for thursday night it's going to be an incredible christmas experience and uh, i also just want to uh, say thank you uh, for the generosity of this church through our year and legacy offering every year um, our church just amazes this team with generosity, and this year has been no exception. So thank you for those of you who last weekend participated through our year-end legacy offering. There's still time through the end of the year to, to be a part of that. So if you've not yet uh, been a part, you can be a part from now through the end of the year. Today, I'm going to introduce to you somebody who's going to bring the final Christmas message before our Christmas Eve message to us. Pastor Gerald Murphy is in the house. Come on, can you make some noise for Pastor Gerald? Some of you know him. Pastor Gerald has been with us for quite some time. He's become just an incredible uh, friend and a part of this team. Uh, and some of you may or may not know this, but Pastor Gerald and, and his wife, Lauren, they actually planted a church here on the west side called Garden City Church. And um, and they asked uh, Katie and I to be their pastors. And we said, absolutely, you have our blessing to, to plant the church. And we're excited to see what God is doing through you. And just a few weeks ago, we celebrated with them the opening of, of the Eden Center, something that uh, is just going to make an incredible difference in our, our city. He's still actively engaged and involved with the Columbus Dream Center and uh, comes to a lot of our staff meetings still. So we, we see Gerald and his family uh, all the time, but we, we are so proud of what they're doing through Garden City Church. And I just, I want Pastor Gerald to be a steady voice uh, to this church as well. And so that's why I've asked him to come this, this final week before Christmas Eve to preach a word for us. So would you one more time, I know it's like a, feels like a Catholic church now because I'm gonna ask you to stand again, but let's do it. Come on, would you stand up one more time and put your hands together and give a big Rock City welcome to Pastor Gerald Murphy. Come on. Praise the Lord, Rock City Church. Praise the Lord. Who's ready for Christmas? Who's ready to give more glory and honor to Jesus? As we celebrate his first coming, you can be seated. It's such an honor to be here, my wife, my family. Uh, we can't even put in words how much Pastor Chad and Katie mean to us, their entire family, how they've supported us, come alongside of us, and have truly been there for us. And I'm just telling you, I'm so expectant for what God has in store for the Church of Columbus. And I'm telling you, Rock City Church has such an incredible part to play in what I believe is the destiny of this city. And I'm so grateful to be a part of this family, be a part of this team, and to continue to see what God is doing. We've been in this series, Are You Ready? And Pastor Todd, he asked a question in his message that I wanna, I wanna share again. He said, are you ready for Christmas is a different question 
then are you ready for Jesus? Are you ready for Christmas is a different question than are you ready for Jesus? And I wanna, I wanna add to the question. My question today is are you ready for the return of the King? Are you ready for the return of the King? Today what we're gonna do is we're gonna unpack lessons that we learn from those who are waiting on Jesus' first coming that can help us as we wait for Jesus' second coming. We'll learn from Mary who was ready to live out her calling with faith. The wise men who are prepared in their hearts to worship with truth. The angel Gabriel who helped us understand that the announcement of Jesus' birth was the announcement of a king and a kingdom unlike any other. Simeon, we're going to learn that, that we should be preparing ourselves to see Jesus face to face. We're going to see him. Anna helps us to understand that we need to be ready to increase prayer and praise like never before. My good friend, Pastor Nate Eckhart, he always says, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. He might have borrowed that from a Christian rapper, but as far as I'm concerned, it's his. If you stay ready, you don't even have to get ready. Would you bow your heads as we pray? Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence that is here. We thank you for the opportunity to come together and lift up our voices individually and corporately, giving worship and honor and glory to God. Open our ears today, open our hearts and open our minds as we come to the word, as we look at the scenes and the stories of the first coming of Jesus to best position ourselves to be ready for the second coming, the return of our King. Above all, be glorified today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's jump right into this. As I was talking to Pastor Chad, he shared something really significant, really profound. According to Pew Research, two in five Americans and nearly half of all Christians believe that we are living in the end times. It's incredible. And when you pair this study and recognize that even those who don't affiliate with any religion, they're called nuns, 29% of them believe that we are living in the last days. When you look at that and you consider the verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, which says, God has put eternity in the heart of man. It's interesting to consider how we, every single person in the depth of our soul, have a God-given knowing that we are moving from one thing to something completely different. And the hope that we have in the gospel is that what is completely different will be new, will be bright, will be perfect, sinless, without sickness. It's a life as we'd all imagine a perfect life would be. And I love that Pastor Chad said this. It's in essence our greatest hope, our most prized desire. And this is precisely what God, in his wisdom, grace, and mercy, has promised to deliver to us through Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible helps us understand and gives us a glimpse of what this is going to look like. Let's look at Revelation 21, 1 through 4. John the Revelator, he is giving language to what he's seen. And he says, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and we will dwell with God. He will dwell with us. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. No more pain, for the former things have passed away. What a powerful passage of scripture. And this is the hope that we have. And the access to this hope is the person of Jesus. This is why every year during Christmas, the whole world is is even more prepared to celebrate his first coming because he's the one that's going to make this a reality, what we read in Revelation 21. So again, I want to, I want to walk through those stories of Jesus' birth, of Jesus' first coming, that we might be able to position ourselves with confidence. I'm going to use that word a few times. We're going to position ourselves with confidence for the second coming of the Lord. Let's look at this first lesson. Being ready for Jesus' return requires our participation. It requires our participation in our own calling and obedience to our own assignments, and it demands faith. We have to be ready to show up to participate in that which God has called us to, to be obedient to the assignment that he's placed on our life and to do so with faith. 
Mary, a, a young virgin woman, blessed and highly favored. She participated. She answered her calling and obeyed her assignment by faith, bringing Jesus into the world. And we now are being invited to live out our calling and our assignment. And we're being asked to do it by faith as well. And it's going to lead to his second coming. Luke 1, 34 through 35 says this, Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. For with God nothing will be impossible. And I love what Mary says. Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. We see that Mary was ready to show up to participate to the call, to the assignment with obedience and faith. The Bible makes it clear in Ephesians 2, 10, that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Every single one of us created, designed with a purpose, a calling, and if we're going to be prepared for the return of the king, we have to say yes to what he's inviting us into. I love that Matthew 24, 14 makes it clear that the gospel of the kingdom must go to the ends of the earth before the end comes. Well, who's going to be preaching? You and I. That in and of itself is an invitation to every single one of us to identify how am I being invited to engage and in seeing the gospel of the kingdom go to every nation, every people group on the earth. Being ready for the return of the king will look like serving. You see, the disciples were asking the same question that we're asking now 2,000 years ago. What will be the sign of the end times? And Jesus walks them through some parables in Matthew 24 and in Matthew 25. In Matthew 24, 45 through 51, I want to paraphrase it. Jesus gives a parable about the end times, commending the faithful servant who continued to work, continued to serve, Continue to steward the master's household well, knowing that he was coming back. He rebuked the evil servant who thought because his master was delaying his coming that he could mistreat people, waste his time getting drunk. But when the master returned, the faithful servant was made ruler over all of his master's goods. The evil servant was cut off and punished. Being ready for the return of the king will look like serving. It will look like engaging, participating. It's also going to look like good stewardship. In Matthew 25, Jesus again gives a parable about the talents. One was given five, one was given two, one was given one. The servants that were given five and two, they took what they were given and they doubled it. The servant with five talents came back with five more. The servant with two talents came back with two more. And this is what the Lord says to them. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So powerful. But the servant with one talent, the scripture says in verse 25, this servant was afraid. He went and he hid his talent. And I want to make something clear, church. Fear is always going to cause us to hide our talents, that which God has given us to steward. Fear is always going to lead us to burying what we were called to steward, what we were called to invest in the kingdom of God with the return. We must resist the fear, resist the temptation to bury what God has given us and instead show up full of faith for we are truly called. I love how Paul, when he's speaking to the church of Philippi, he says, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Paul doesn't beat around the bush. He says, yes, it's a crooked and perverse generation, but you were called to it and you were called to shine as lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. This is what faithful servants who steward their talents will do. The evil servant heard troubling words. This evil servant was cast away, was called unprofitable, was cast away into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I, I want to make it very clear. Jesus doesn't desire to cast anyone into outer darkness. 
Jesus does not desire to cast anyone away into outer darkness, into hell. No, what he desires, the vision of Jesus, the one who made us, the one who created us, his vision, his desire is that we would actually rule and reign with him. Not only saving us, forgiving us of our sins, but no, the very original intent and design for all humanity was to rule and reign with the king. It's incredible. We see in Daniel chapter 7, verse 27, then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. Revelation 5 and 10 says that he's made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. This is the desire. This is the vision that the Lord has for every single one of us. Again, as I already mentioned, in Matthew 24 and 25, the disciples, they were asking questions about the end times. We've been in the end times since Jesus resurrected. We've been in the end times since Jesus resurrected. And what did Jesus say to the disciples in Matthew 28? He said, all power and authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Now, because of that, go. Go, therefore, make disciples of the nations. This is a time to be active, to be productive. The end times are to be a time of expansion, taking ground for the kingdom, not shrinking back in fear. For we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. This is our portion. This is the call of every believer. And to walk out our calling, to be obedient to our assignment, it takes the same thing for us that it took for Mary, the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells the disciples in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that the Spirit was going to fall on them and endue them with power to be witnesses of Jesus Christ in the earth. This is what every single one of us need, the power of the Holy Spirit active and alive in our lives, producing what? Christ in us, the hope of glory. This is the great mystery of the incredible gospel. Not just Christ with us, but Christ in us. And of all the ways that he could have advanced his kingdom and advanced his mission, he said, I'm going to leave and turn the keys over to you, my church. I'm going to fill you with my spirit. I'm going to be on the inside of you. To be ready for the return of the king, we must show up, participate in our calling, be obedient to our assignment with faith. The next thing I want to talk about is that being ready for Jesus' return means that we are preparing to worship the king and to submit to his kingdom. And I want to say to you that that submission is one of the truest expressions of real worship. You can sing a song and not be submitted. You can lift your hands and not be submitted. And what we see in the first coming of Jesus is that it was, it was more than just, just knowing about Jesus, knowing where he was going to be born, but the invitation that we see from the wise men is true worship and submission. Matthew 2, 1 through 8, in verses 12 and 16 says this, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he? Who has been born king of the Jews for we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him when Herod the king heard this he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes the religious leaders of Israel all the people together he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born so they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea for thus it is written by the prophet but you Bethlehem in the land of Judah are not the least among the rulers of Judah for out of you shall come a ruler who will be shepherd, the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Herod even knew how to lie good. He knew that the appropriate response was worship. So to convince the wise men, that he was on their side, he just echoed what he heard them say. Verse 12 says, Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Verse 16 says that Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts 
from two years old and under according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Let's unpack this. Jesus, the one true king, he alone deserves our submission. Herod was not willing to submit and bow to another king. So he tried to kill him. Jesus is the one true king who deserves our worship. The Pharisees and the scribes, the religious leaders, they were, they were content on just knowing the right information about the Messiah and his birth. But they were indifferent when it came to seeking him out. When it came to actually worshiping him, they would have read Isaiah 9 and 6. The Pharisees, the scribes, the religious leaders, they would have read, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. They quoted rightly Micah chapter 5 verses 2 and 4, mentioning where the king was to be born. The end of that passage even says that the Messiah's greatness would reach the ends of the earth. But even in knowing the right information about the birth of Jesus, they missed their moment. They were not moved, they were not provoked to seek him out. You see, religion will leave us content in just knowing things about God, but a real relationship will always provoke you to worship the God you know. Religion will always make us content with just being puffed up in knowledge, knowing the right information. But when you have a real relationship with the king, you will be provoked every time to bow before him in worship, to submit to him and give him praise. Jesus is the one true king who is worth our affection. The wise men understood this. And I find it so fascinating. See, these wise men, they would have not grown up hearing about the prophecies foretelling of the Messiah's birth. They were not Jews. They came from distant countries. They didn't know the scriptures. They didn't have the years and years and years of study that the Pharisees and the scribes did. And maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking to yourself, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. My parents weren't Christians. I didn't grow up going to church. How can I actually know if Jesus is real? I'm telling you in the same way that the Spirit of God revealed Jesus to wise men who knew nothing about these former prophecies, that the Spirit of God is here to reveal Jesus to you today. I love that this is in the Word. The ones who should have been the, 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 the most incapable of perceiving rightly the moment were the ones that actually perceived it rightly. It's incredible to me. It's incredible. When you consider that these wise men were from other nations, it even points to the reality that Revelation in 7 and 9 tells us every nation, tribe, people, and tongue will gather to bring worship to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Haggai 2 and 7 tells us that Jesus himself is the very desire of the nations. The invitation for us as we prepare for the second coming of Jesus, the return of the king, is to worship and submit to him. The next lesson I want to talk about is the fact that if we're going to be ready for Jesus' return, the return of the king, it requires us to recognize that he is unlike any other king and his kingdom is unlike any other kingdom. We cannot make the mistakes that the religious leaders made 2,000 years ago putting our perception of what a king should be like and, and what a government, what a, what, a, what a kingdom should be like. No, we have to get in the word and, and adjust and align with, with who he says he is and what he says his kingdom is like. The angel Gabriel, he gives the announcement of Jesus' birth in Luke 1, 32 and 33. It's an announcement of a new king. and It's an announcement of his reign. The Bible says he will be great and he will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Thrones are only for kings. Jesus' life began with King Herod being threatened by him and his kingdom. Before he's crucified, Jesus collides with another world leader, Pontius Pilate of Rome, governor of Judea. And the issue of whether or not he was the king was still the very, si very same thing that was being discussed right at the end of his life. John 18, Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? You can almost hear, Pilate's kind of, he's got a, kind of an attitude. He's got a, a tone in his voice. Like, are you the king or not? 
Just tell me, are you the king of the Jews or not? And I love Jesus' answer. Verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. Pilate acknowledges that Jesus is a king to his people and to the chief priests of Israel in John 19, 14 and 15. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews, but they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate says, shall I crucify your king? That's what he asked. They said, we have no king but Caesar. This is what the chief priest, the religious leader said. They simply couldn't accept that Jesus was the king they had been waiting for. He truly is unlike any other king. What makes him so different? He's the only king that would die for the very people that he created that have done nothing but disobey him and rebel against him. And he says in John 10, 17 and 18, I lay my life down. No one takes it from me. I lay it down because the father asked me to. He is the same king who Paul mentions in Galatians chapter three, verse 13. He says, I'm gonna redeem my people from the law of the curse by becoming a curse for them. No other king has ever done that. He's the king that we read about who became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. There is no king like Jesus. The Father makes it clear that he so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever would believe upon him would not perish, but have everlasting life. I want you to understand what that means. God allowed us, the guilty, to kill his son, the only true innocent one, and called it justice. God allowed us, the wicked, kill the only true righteous one, and he called it mercy. Who wouldn't serve a God like that, a king like that? There's no one like him, and there's no other kingdom like, like his the angel Gabriel goes on to say that he will reign over the house of Jacob and of his kingdom there will be no end. And it reminds you of things that the prophet Daniel said, that the kingdom of our God will break into pieces and consume every other kingdom and his alone will stand forever. At the end of Daniel 7, 27, it says his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. I love what the scripture says in Revelation 11, 15. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever. What we have to understand is for Jesus to be fully enthroned, everything that opposes him has to be dethroned has to come down. That's why he's bringing judgment against his enemy and all the evils of this earth. When we read about it in Revelation 19, verse 2 says, for true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot Babylon. Every time you see Babylon in scripture, I want you to think of every wicked and every evil worldly system that causes injustice and oppression and death and death and destruction of God's people. Jesus is coming to judge and destroy this system, those who love it and those who refuse him. But he's not just coming back as a righteous judge. He's also coming back as a bridegroom. He's coming back for a bride who has made herself ready. Right blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. These are the true sayings of God. In the end, we will either be numbered among those who love the world or Babylon, or we will be numbered among the body of Christ, the bride who has made herself ready for the king. The issue with the Pharisees and the scribes, these religious leaders, is they couldn't bring themselves to recognize Jesus as their king because he didn't look like what they expected. They were expecting a king that would overtake Rome. Jesus was not merely interested in victory over human, political, and governmental systems, but victory over the demonic influence and agendas behind them. And they couldn't see that. That's why the scripture tells us in 1 John 3 and 8, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And we as his followers, as his believers, according to John 14, 12, are called to do the same, the same works that he did. Luke 19.10 makes it clear, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He's coming for it all. He's wanting to restore everything. So the question is, are we going to yield to a king who may not look like what we think a king should look like? Are we going to yield to a kingdom that no other kingdom on this planet 
has ever, ever compared to. The next lesson, being ready for Jesus' return, it's an invitation for inexpressible joy. As we reflect on the day that we will finally see the man who saved us, the one that we prayed to, the one that we've sang to, the one that we followed, we're going to see him. We're going to see him with our eyes. We're going to touch him. We're going to hold him. He's going to hold us. This should produce inexpressible joy in the heart of those who are in him. Simeon helps us understand as, as he was one who had the opportunity to take baby Jesus after he was born, hold him and lift him up. He was able to, to see him, to touch him, to hear his cry, responding with overwhelming joy at the gift of seeing baby Jesus face to face. How often do you think about the joy that it will be to see your king in the flesh? This joy should be an active motivator to what it looks like to live ready for the return of the king. Luke 2 Verse 25, beginning, tells us, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all the peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles, to the nations, and the glory of your people, Israel. Amen. We're going to see him. Those who are in him, those who have allowed him to forgive you of your sins, those who have put your faith and your trust in him. We're going to see him. We're going to see his eyes of fire. We're going to hear his voice that sounds like many rushing waters. We, like Apostle Thomas, we're going to actually put our hands in his wounds. Apostle Thomas didn't want to take anybody else's word. Nobody else's word for the reality of Jesus resurrecting from the dead. He said, I want to touch him for myself. I want to touch him for myself, and I'm here to tell you today that we too are going to see the wounded one, the wounded king. And I love this so much about Jesus. For eternity, we're going we're gonna to see the marks in his hands, in his side, that prove his love for us, that prove the price that he paid for us. For all of eternity, he desires to be associated with the very wounds that purchased us. It's incredible. The wounded one, the one who was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, chastised for our peace. By his stripes, we are healed. We will finally behold our wounded king in person. As I talk about him being wounded, let me make it very clear. He was wounded, but victorious. He was wounded, but triumphant. He was wounded, but a conquering king who overcame death, hell, and the grave. And because he overcame, those of us who are in him, we will overcome too. By the blood of the lamb, by the word of our testimony, not loving our lives even unto death. We're going to see him. I want you to know that the coming of the Lord is not something that you should fear. But my Bible says in 1 John 2, 28 and 29, and now little children abide in him that when he appears, we may have confidence. And maybe you've grown up hearing about the return of the Lord and it's brought fear. I'm telling you today that there's an invitation to break out of fear, to dust that off and recognize that this is a day to look forward to with joy and expectation. That word confidence, it means free and free. Fearless, confident, cheerful courage, boldness, and assurance that we would not be ashamed before him at his coming. Those who are in Christ have no reason to fear the coming of the Lord. It is a day to long for, to desire, to yearn for, to wait on with eager expectation. And I believe that even after today, some of you, you're going you're to experience a shift in your spirit and how you're perceiving the coming of the Lord. It's going to be something that is going to have a fresh joy in the name of Jesus. Being ready for Jesus' return, it's an invitation to increase our prayer life. It's an invitation to increase praise. It's an invitation 
to increase intimacy in the presence of the Lord. This is what we learn from Anna. A woman who after her husband passed away spent decades upon decades in the temple waiting for the first coming of Jesus. Talk about a strong prayer life, a strong praise lifestyle, someone who loved intimacy in the presence of the Lord. What a legacy. And here we are 2,000 years later reading about a woman who did nothing but spend her days in the temple ministering to the heart of the Lord through prayer and praise, waiting for the coming of Jesus' birth. Luke 2, 36 through 38 says there was also a prophet or a prophetess named Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old and she had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. I find it fascinating that prayer is the one thing the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to do. They saw this man walk on water. They saw him raise the dead. And the only thing they specifically said, hey, can we do it too, was prayer. Because they understood that all of the miracles had a source. They understood that that all of the mighty exploits that they were witnessing had a source. And it was Jesus knowing his identity as a son coming before the Father and spending Who knows how much time being before the Father in prayer. You might ask yourself, what should we pray right here? We have 66 books of promises. We have 66 books of truth. And the Lord is asking for us to come before him in his presence and to agree with what he's already said. I challenge you to learn how to read, pray, and sing the scripture. We read the scripture to bring our minds into alignment. We pray the scripture to bring our wills into alignment. But we sing the scripture to bring our hearts into alignment. And this is what Anna was doing, waiting for the first coming of the Lord. And I'm telling you, there's testimonies all over the world, communities of prayer and around unreached people groups and nations where the gospel is outlawed, where the Bible is outlawed. And I'm telling you, all the degrees and all the knowledge and the apologetics is not, is, is not what's winning hearts. But it's a community of people through prayer and worship opening up eyes to see Jesus as the king. Do you know that your praise is evangelistic? Psalm 40 verse 3 says, he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to my God, and many people will see it and fear and put their trust in him. Just your song can open up people's eyes to the beauty of Jesus, putting their trust in him. What do we do with all of this? It produces a cry, a very specific cry, a specific prayer. And it's found in Revelation 22, 17. The Bible says the spirit and the bride say come. The spirit and the bride say come. I want to teach you a word. It's Maranatha. Maranatha. And it means come Lord Jesus. It's found one time in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 16, 22. And I believe with all of my heart that to the degree, to the measure that the spirit, that heaven is saying, come Lord Jesus. There's coming a day where there's going to be an echo from the bride of Jesus Christ in the earth. And we're going to be calling out for the return of the Lord. This is what it looks like to live ready for the king. I don't just want the benefits of his kingdom. I want the king himself. I don't want just the blessings of his kingdom. I want him. He's coming back for a bride who desires him more than anything. And it demands a response. We all started right here, hearing the good news of Jesus and deciding how were we going to respond. Being ready for Jesus' return requires repentance, receiving, responding to the invitation to follow him. Being ready for Jesus requires repentance, receiving his love, his mercy, his grace. It requires responding to the invitation to follow him. When we talk about repentance, A lot of times we can focus on what it is that we're turning away from. But I want to tell you that repentance is just just as much about what you're turning to. And you're turning to a king. To his kingdom. Righteousness. 
peace and joy, a new life, a new name, a new identity, a new purpose. And when he invites us to repent, I want you to understand he has refreshing in his mind. He says, repent, Acts 3, 19. Repent, therefore, be converted, be transformed, that your sins may be blotted out. That phrase, blotted out, it means to obliterate. Jesus didn't die on the cross just to, to, to allow you to, to have some good days and bad days. No, he died on the cross to obliterate your sin, to obliterate what the enemy has used to hold you back from your purpose in this life, to wipe it out, to erase it as far as the east is from the West, but it requires repentance. And then he says that by doing so, the times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. This is his desire for us. Repentance, it's preceded by the revelation of the one who's inviting us to follow him. A change of mind, a change of direction to follow Jesus. And once we've seen him, the one who loved us so much that he laid his life down. We know that the only appropriate response is to give our life to him. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to do what you do best right now. Would you touch every heart that is far from you? We pray right now, according to your word, with faith. You said that if we confess Jesus Christ as Lord and believe in our heart, that God, you raised him from the dead, that we would be saved. You promised that anyone, you said everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. So right now we do that. Forgive us of our sins. Bring us into the new life that you've promised. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. And we say from this day forward, we will live for you. We will follow you. Responding to the calling on our life. Living ready for your return where you will make all wrong things right and you will reign forever. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, welcome to the family of God. Welcome into the family of God. And maybe you're wondering, what can I do right now to begin to follow Jesus? We wanna encourage you that right after service, there is a baptism taking place. We have towels, we have clothes, everything you need. If you feel a stirring in your spirit to get baptized today, as you've made a confession of faith, don't hesitate. Join into the water. The Bible says as you go down into the water, you are identifying with the death of Jesus. And as you come up out of that water, you are identifying with the resurrection life that Jesus has purchased for you. Don't hesitate. Get baptized today.